Hi, I am Christina Venegas, and um, I'm thrilled to be here with our panel and my colleagues, um, Gerardo Aldana from the Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies, um, Giovanni Bats, also from the Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies, and Dinah Sanchez, likewise, from the Chicana and Chicano Studies. Well represented. <laughs> Um, so we are going to start right away because we um, don't have a lot of time and there's probably much more to talk about than we can um, get to. But um, I want to start, um, as you know, um, Gerardo was the one of the cultural consultants um, on the film. And so I really want to hear from him. This is often um, a difficult relationship and I think it went really well. <laughs> Um, so, um, we've read about other instances, you know, in these relationships, and so I really want to hear more about your involvement in the film and, um, and how that relationship evolved um, as, as you went on. Good, good, um, thanks. And first, I feel like I really need to thank you all for being here, um, for sticking around. It's a very long movie, um, but it's actually... It's kind of impactful for me to have been working on this film with that community, like the filmmakers, for so long and not being able to share it with the people who I work with every day. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just really grateful to all of you for um, inviting us to be here and for talking about the film with me because, you know, like you sign an NDA and then you can't say anything. And so this is finally a chance for me to do what I longed to do. So I appreciate that. Um, when it comes to my involvement in the film, it did start off, and it was very much kind of, it was a call with the executive producer, um, Barry Waldman, and he said, he was kind of gave, made two main points. He said, on the one hand, it's not gonna be all that much. Um, you're just gonna be asked to look at some concept art and some costumes and stuff, and you'll give us thumbs up, thumbs down. So, so the first conversation, I was like, oh, this is gonna be easy, but it's gonna be great because it's Black Panther 2. Um, so I was really excited about that. The second part that really got me worried actually was when he said, um, and so it's kind of, the idea is that we're kind of doing Atlantis, but it's with Mayans. And that just freaked me out because like 19th century, that was the colonial rhetoric, right? Like these folks could not have made the pyramids themselves. These indigenous folks could not have accomplished all of this. So let's just invent this civilization underwater in Atlantis and say that that's the people who made all these wonderful things that we see. And that's, I was like, you know, Black Panther, but if that's what it is, I can't do that. And what I loved was that um, Ryan Coogler was like, no, it's the inverse. What it is is that uh, all of the brilliance of Mesoamerican culture remains indigenous, but now they create something new in this new world. And so very soon it turned out that Barry was, was wrong. I mean, it was a lot more than just thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, it, began, it began with like reviews of concept art and then discussions about costumes. But then they were talking about, well, we want to use hieroglyphs in this. And so that was just exciting because that's kind of what I do. So um, all of the glyphs that you see are glyphs that I got to draw for the film. And that's just really powerful to see. Um, <laughs> So then it went from that to kind of the even deeper dive where we're talking about, okay, let's think about cosmology. Let's think about um, how are we essentially, in Linda Tuiwe Smith's words, how are we indigenizing this film? Um, and that, that, I think, was entirely driven by Ryan Coogler's vision. Mm -hmm. um, he was, I think from the beginning, he was seeing as, as an intervention, right? He knows, obviously, the impact that Black Panther had um, in the black community in the United mm -hmm. States, but also in the African diaspora. And I think that that, you know, he may not have ever said it explicitly, but he knew he had the opportunity to do something like that for indigenous and Latinx communities. And, and I think that's what the aspiration was. It was not like almost, you're kind of afraid to say it because it's a big hope, but that's always in the background. Like in all of my conversations with Ruth Carter on on um, costumes with Hannah Beekler on set design, like when we're doing props, whatever, it's always in the background that there's this 
there's this respect and this hope, this aspiration that we can produce something um, of that caliber. So it was, it was an incredible experience. I read somewhere that, I think it was an interview with Hannah Beachler that she was zoomed in in one of your classes. <laughs> um, well, so what happened was we, these, these conversations were never really just consultations. What was fantastic about it, I mean, and, and you kind of understand this over time, is that we're sitting in these Zoom rooms and it's black artists and me as a Chicano scholar. And we're like, this is people of color creating. Like that was a different space. And, and we were all kind of, we had this commitment to like a nuanced representation. Mm -hmm. So our discussions were never, they weren't just conversations. They were like seminars, like grad school experiences. Mm -hmm. Like the best grad school experiences where you're not lecturing, you're just kind of all kind of in on it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think that's probably what she was referring to that like, it felt like it was class sometimes and, and it was fun. Um, which is amazing. And so maybe we can start with some of the elements of that, like the name, yeah. um, the use of his name. Um, you mentioned something about this and I thought it was really important. Um, name or, and, I mean, he has many names, right? Yeah, so it was, it was kind of like a complication from the very beginning because like, okay, so we're gonna go with Yucatec Mayan, but, but in Yucatec, there is no sound R. So you can't have Namor as his name. So I'm saying this at the beginning, I'm like, you can't have Namor as his name. And they're like, this is Marvel, so you kind of have to have Namor as his name. <laughs> um, so, so we're thinking about how to do this. It didn't really become an issue until we started writing the glyphs. Because in the hieroglyphic texts, we wanted to write his history. And so what were we gonna put? We couldn't put Namor. So we came up with Siah um, Polao Kukulkan, which means the Kukulkan who was born in the ocean. And so that's what you see, if you see the text and if you parse them, that's what it reads as. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that's where we were also connected to talking about um, how he's not um, a god, he's Kukulkan. What does Kukulkan mean? And you start talking about cosmology. And so it, it ended up being, I think, a really rich representation mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. um, kind of the distinction between Mesoamerican religiosity and um, kind of Western cosmologies. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the things that's really, I mean, I, I have to confess, I have not seen all the Marvel movies, so I'm not an expert, <laughs> but I love this movie. <laughs> so, but one of the things that strikes me is the combination of both uh, of having, well, you have to be part of the Marvel universe, right? And then being yeah. able to incorporate all these different elements um, that have to respond to different aspects of representation, different historic cosmologies, et cetera, what you've been mentioning. So um, the use of blue skin um, signals transformation. Um, it signals biological adaptation, it, you know, advancement. Um, what's, what's, there's, there's also brown skin and black skin and there's wet skin and, you know, it's like the skin is really an important element in the film as, as a breathing tool. And so can we talk a little bit more, what's going on with the blue skin um, in the film? And, and, and all the, anyone can jump in too um, in this, in, in the question, so. Yeah, yeah, this is, I mean, I love this because one of the, you know, we did talk a little bit ahead of time and this is one of my favorite conversations that we've had so far is, that yeah, you have to have the blue skin because you're being faithful to the comics. And so there's that question about like, um, how faithful are you going to be? And, and the distinction was they're blue when they're not in the water, but when they are in the water, they're their brown skin color. And so that, that was the, the side where, for how I understood it. What I understood was, okay, if we're gonna make this into a concept that works um, for the culture, not just for the film, then that distinction has to be there because as um, these folks who are moving out of their home space, they look different, right? So when they're blue skinned, that, and, and that's what happens to you know, indigenous communities when they leave their homelands, they aren't seen the same as when they're seen at home. And so we were started talking about that and, and Dana, you were like. I didn't think about the blue skin <laughs> when I was watching the film, but when Gerardo mentioned it when we were starting these discussions, I had just gotten back from Oaxaca um, over winter break, and I was in my grandpa's hometown. So my family has been displaced for multiple 
generation. So thanks to the government um, and land conflict, um, I'm from a town called Yohovi where my grandpa was born there. And I was there and it's, I think, the first time I've really spent more time there than in Solaga where my parents were born. And I was just like, I'm not from here. Mm-hmm. And like, even <coughs> though I claim it as much as I can, anything good, I'm like, oh, it's because I'm from Yohovi. Uh, <laughs> because it's also an identity that's stigmatized um, in that area as well. I'm like, I'm gonna claim it. Um, but I was there and I was like, I'm not from here, I'm from Solaga. Like I speak the Zapotec that we speak in Solaga. I can try to defend myself in Yohovi Zapotec, but I'm like, I'm different. Uh, and that's because we've been displaced for multiple generations already. And then we also got into these conversations where Giovanni and I were both born in diaspora, right? Mm-hmm. So we're from indigenous communities, uh, but we were both born in LA. And that adds this different, an additional yeah. dimension, right? And I really appreciate what Gio was saying during the conversation where his blue skin is speaking English, right? And our blue skin is all of these different things, right? We phenotypically look different from the people, Mm -hmm. um, sometimes from where we're from, right? Um, I was talking about the film with our colleague, uh, Florida Mabos Lopez from UCLA, um, and she was talking, but it was separate, I think it was a separate discussion of being part of the diaspora. She's like, it's our clothes, it's like the way we carry ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like, there's so many things that make us different from the communities that we come from, but, I'll turn it to Gio to talk about <laughs> authenticity. <laughs> uh, no, well, first off, thank you to the organizers for putting on this event, and obviously Gerardo for inviting us to be part of this panel. I, I think we both appreciate it. Um, we spoke before. And uh, yeah, this is the second time I saw the film, so I think there's still a lot to process, right? Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot that I'm like um, thinking about, and you know, you kind of leave a little bit like longing, right? I think we talked about this film is. Uh, characterized by grief, right, by um, T'Challa and um, uh, Bozeman's character, right? Um, but I think I just realized, you know, watching the film that Neymar and, and well, not Neymar, that's what his enemies call him, right? Ahu <laughs> Kulkan, um, him and his people were literally landless, right? So people went to the water. Um, and it's sad to see that they do become blue, meaning that they become foreigners on their own ancestral territories, right? And for me, that was extremely depressing to see, um, so there was a lot of themes that kind of, uh, you know, I could really definitely like uh, feel for uh, Neymar or Akhul Kulkan. Um, the fact that he had to go bury his mom uh, in his ancestral territories and seeing the injustice, right? So that was what, what um, uh, Dana was talking about, being born in diaspora or being born in exile, right? Because diaspora sometimes is like a very like nice term, but sometimes a lot of people are displaced. They can't go home for a lot of reasons. Um, and I think that sense of like belonging, you know, you can kind of see he's not really from anywhere, right? Physiologically, he's, he's, he's distinct. Um, so I think thinking about it in that way, um, being a foreigner in your own homeland, trying to recover your culture and identity, it wasn't until a conversation that we had with Gerardo, the fact that they're using glyphs, right? That the glyphs would have been out of, you know, they wouldn't have been able to use glyphs at that point in time. So Neymar, trying the glyphs and trying to recover it. I got a bunch of tattoos, right? So I, that's why I was like, okay, like I, I feel that, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the blue skin, as, as Dana was talking about, like not really being from here or there, um, but trying to reconnect in your own way. I think that was a theme that really, um, you know, spoke to me. Mm-hmm. And then with the grief that you're talking about and this, I think we're talking about migration as well, right, mm-hmm. in the imagery. Um, one of the things that I thought about when we were watching the film this time is for a lot of people, because we have to migrate without authorization, the only way you can go back is when you die, mm-hmm. right? Repatriation. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And the need that we feel as indigenous people to be buried in our homeland, right? And that's mm-hmm. something that I think the film and the sentiment that Kukulkan has in, and his mother has, right? And like, take me back at least mm-hmm. in death. Right, I think that also hit very close to home. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's the the question of diaspora um, is re- it's woven throughout the film in many ways. I mean, it's interesting how we have right. We we end up in certain places. We in Haiti and in Cape Verde, and um, so there are these specific you know, locations of the African diaspora, and then 
when he first emerges um, in, um, in Wakanda, and what does he say? The first thing, ah, the air, and there's a place where you don't have to li leave, right? A place where you can be and you don't have to leave. And so it, it's quite explicit um, how he's pointing to that. But yeah, it's that, that visual of the heads coming up out of the water is really haunting and, and a ghostly image of, of something we see um, and we think about all too, um, all too often in terms of the migration. Of, mm. But of then there, there's the flip side of it too, right? So, <laughs> so there is the part where they're like, okay, we are now exiled, we are now outside. Um, and he says, you didn't have to change who you are, right? right? Um, but then what they, and this was also really excited, exciting, this question of what happens if an indigenous community does not have to go through colonialism? What do you create? And that was also really inspirational, right? Like you're, you're not bound to all of the frameworks that we think of in um, this world, globalized world that we live in. You can actually come up with alternative um, like cultural ways of being, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you're rooted to what you know and what you love. So for me, this was a huge thing because, um, mm -hmm. you know, we had all kinds of conversations in the conceptualization of what that Lokan would look like. Uh, but, but, they, but Hannah and Ryan included something that to me was really powerful. And that was that uh, we talked about what do they need to survive when they're in the ocean, but also what, what do they want to feel connected, to still feel indigenous. And so one of the things we're talking about is like maize, is corn is like central to ancient Mesoamerica, right? It's like part of their mythology, it's part of their everyday life, it's part of their sust. Maize is it. And so, so we were talking about, okay, if there are these incredible agriculturalists and they had vibranium, one of the places they would channel their technology mm -hmm. is into creating a corn that grows at the bottom of the ocean, not because they need it, because they have tons of food and they have everything they need, but because they need it culturally. And so if you, you don't know if you noticed or not, but there's a scene when, when Shuri is being brought through um, Tabakan and they stop and they see uh, a family tending the mm -hmm. maze that's down at the bottom. And so the fact that they included that, right? I think that yeah. shows um, Ryan's and Hannah's commitment to having it be culturally rich as, and, and nuanced as opposed to kind of just a, a, a superficial, yeah, we have Mesoamericans underwater. Yeah, I mean, it, and, and in addition to that, um, and, and because she, Hannah, uh, it, Beachler talks about, um, you know, sort of going to all these different places to look for influences, to see colors, to see, you know, what were all these different elements, and they were doing that in South Africa for um, the African um, culture they wanted to, inspire, you know, create with um, Black Panther, but also to do exactly the same thing um, with um, what they were doing for um, the Mayan world. Um, and, but it was also, it also really struck me tonight when I saw it is this, this, um, we see the world when we finally see it, this beautiful empire under the water, we see it through Shuri, Princess Shuri, and she marvels, right? She's in that suit and she gets, and she gets to travel through, I guess, some sort of thermal vent that takes her through the <laughs> sea note. I mean, which is, that's a, just an amazing sequence. And then, you know, it kind of opens up and we get this fabulous music um, that creates this um, fantastical kind of um, atmosphere for seeing and marveling. So there's, you know, there's, there's also um, being, it, we're seeing it through her as well. And she is just as taken aback um, by what, you know, what is there and, what, and, the, and then of course the vibranium um, is revealed. Um, but so much of the film, as you said, um, in, or both of you have mentioned the question of grief. And it, I mean, it's, it's all over the film, right? It's like, it's really, in, in it, and I'm struck by it because it's really well done in, in the sense that they're, I mean, they had a huge task. They had to remake the script. Um, redo the story entirely, rethink everything. Um, so they're saying goodbye to their friend, they're saying goodbye to the character in the story, um, and that, but then, you know, all of the different um, aspects of that, the 
funeral ceremonies, um, bringing back to memory what is going to be honored. And family is one of the things that's really crucial um, in all of this. So family is itself being mourned um, and celebrated. Um, and so um, the, the, you know, they're really invested in some way in signaling change. Yeah. And I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I think I really like that you bring up the whole question of, of grief too, because it, it speaks to a point that I think is critical at multiple levels in, in the film, right? Um, because it, it really is about grief and it's about Chadwick Boseman. That's centrally what the film is about. And, and that's the work it has to do for all kinds of reasons, for the filmmakers and for the audience. But I think it was also at a moment, right, when like all of us needed to be able to process grief, right? Like coming out of the pandemic, we all lost something. We all had, and so it's, mm -hmm. it's cathartic mm -hmm. in that way to be able to watch a film and experience grief and see how multiple people are dealing with it differently. That's, that's one thing that's really powerful in its core to the film. But, but it, it's also telling us that that means that if that's what's so central, how did they pay so much attention to the world building of Talokan? Mm -hmm. And that to me is the second big theme is it's, it's because that's what allyship looks like, right? So what Ryan was doing as a filmmaker is he was being an ally to indigenous and Latinx communities by saying, we're not going to just have this superficial, you know, use Mesoamerica as a prop. We're going to create a world that allows folks to have an experience when they're watching this that, um, you know, that speaks to them. as pe And that's what I think, I mean, I hope folks what you're saying, like when you're talking about the different ways you relate to the film, when you talk about the different ways you relate to Namor even, or any of the characters, like there's something there that's, that's more than just what we see in so many other films, mm -hmm. even Marvel films and representations of indigenous people. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so I think that that's what's huge, that there's like this allyship. And it doesn't just come out in the content. Yeah, they're allies at the end, mm -hmm. but it's also happening in the discussions that we have, right? The, uh, the way we were working together um, in making the film. I mean, I think all of that, it, it's just a central theme. And, and I think it speaks to what we need to deal with in these days. And I think the beauty of that, and I think we were talking about it earlier, is that that does exist, right? Because I was like, yeah. Gerardo, like who was in this room with you, right? <laughs> and in my mind, it's black and brown people, right? Yeah. Because it, you need black and brown solidarity for that to happen, right? Or people mm -hmm. to value the voices of black and brown folks. And again, taking what we drew from the film, like that's South Central, right? That's South Central LA. Um, again, speaking to like the background, the city that we come from, right? And the possibilities that exist for us as indigenous people to form of our, our identities in certain pockets of LA, right? That are sometimes safer. Uh, when there's discrimination from within our quote-unquote home community, right? So mm -hmm. I think that is the beauty of that. And then going back to the theme of grief, uh, I was telling uh, my co-panelists that when I first saw the movie, um, I was grieving the world that I saw as something I never knew, right? Mm -hmm. The world that we lost because of colonization. But again, my colleague, uh, was talking about how she saw it as indigenous maturity, right? Yep. Where I was like, oh, like I don't want to romanticize, but like it would have been so amazing <laughs> to live in that kind of world. Uh, yeah. And then she was like, no, but I didn't see it that way. I saw it as indigenous maturity. And I was like, oh, like that blew my mind, right? And I think that's what the intent you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, very, I mean, we had a lot of, I mean, tons of conversations early on. Um, and, and one of the themes that came up was this notion of Afrofuturism built into Wakanda and, and the first Black Panther. And so I, I, you know, had heard a little bit, but I decided, you know what, I should probably read Octavia Butler. And I became the biggest geek for Octavia Butler ever right now. I just love everything. <laughs> I'm reading everything I can. But, but it's also connected to all of these other futurities that exist, right? Indigenous futurities, mm -hmm. Latinx futurities. And so there's this, what, this is why, I mean, I think it's really exciting to think about what it might be like to be a 10 year old kid seeing this. Because now you can like, your imagination then can open up to something that so many of us who are older, considerably older, did not have 
mm -hmm. the capacity to imagine. And so uh, I remember distinctly we, one of the first times they sent me this package of concept art and there were all these figures and a lot of these figures looked very Atlantean, you know, just mm -hmm. kind of space age, but underwater. And then I come across this one image and, and it's this, it's a really like indigenous looking warrior guy, but he's underwater and he just looks fierce. And I went back to like my 10 year old self and I thought, oh my God, if I could like play with this as an action figure or something, that would be amazing. <laughs> and, and I felt like, yeah, that would, that's the kind of thing you want to re reach people with. We'll see if it's okay. If yeah, it's, yeah. So yeah. I, I guess there's two things. So again, I'm processing a lot of these things, but yeah, I think the, I think they did a really good job. Like I didn't leave as, like I didn't leave angry when, as in comparison to Avatar too, for instance, like which is other blue people, but you know, that's, that's, another, that's another topic. Uh, but I did like the themes of decolonization and calls for allyship, right? So when uh, Neymar Kulkulkalm talks about the um, broken people are leaders, so I'm paraphrasing there, obviously I thought about Wretched of the Earth, yeah. right? Um, you know, I, I'm always reading for the anti-heroes and, and bad guys like Killmonger, right? Um, I, those are my true heroes, right? The radicals, but um, the fact that they portray Namor as void of love, um, you know, viewing indigenous peoples as reactionary, you know, I think, um, con cuidado there. Um, but it, in terms of like mourning and longing, yes, like, like what, what Dana was uh, saying, I, I do echo those sentiments of like, man, like, you know, you kind of get this sense, right? Um, and that's not why I'm dressed in black, but, but you know, <laughs> you're kind of like longing. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, props to the director and folks who uh, worked on this film, but it left me wanting more. Right, mm -hmm. it's, we're talking about indigenous world building but without an indigenous director, right? So the case of Reservation Dogs, which is an amazing show, obviously, hopefully a lot of y'all have seen it, uh, other native um, uh, produced films and things like that. I think that's definitely needed. So I'm like, I'm looking for that Maya or Zapotec, like director, producer, like actors, actresses, et cetera, right? Um, so that's what I want, right? And that's the way to like kind of honor. So that's like, um, I think they did a really good job in terms of the film. I'm a huge indigenous nerd. So like, I definitely appreciated this film and hit out of those like, um, you know, I think it was produced in a very dignified way for sure. Um, but yeah, it left me wanting more, right? So it wanted me to create, right? In the same way that uh, Neymar did it. Yeah. Let's make a film, Dana. I <laughs> Coming soon. We're gonna start a GoFundMe. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, part of, uh, yeah. Um, the casting of Tenoch uh, Huerta Mejia, who as as uh, Kukulkan, um, and I'm mispronouncing that, but I'll have to work on that. We have to get some lessons. Um, but I mean, he brings so much subtlety to this that kind of helps us ameliorate some of some of what um, we are left wanting, right? Because there's there's a quality to him that is that there is a sadness and yet and I love when he says I'm a mutant um, and that's a good thing and yet it's also um, comes out of great loss um, but it's that mutation also that is encapsulating the film as well in, in every way but it's it speaks to both this kind of pain but we're at the source of power um, for a new world that that should be created, right? And I mean, and, and it's interesting to me that this film has all those gigantic ideas in it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's one of the things I really hope people, one of the reasons I hope people watch it more than once, because I think there are mm, layers there upon are, layers, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And I think even when you're talking about um, Kukulkan, right? So we're saying, what does that even mean? Um, Kukulkan is, is, is legend, is myth, is mm -hmm. deity, is, so much in mm -hmm, um, Yucatan mm -hmm. and then in also as Cucumats in, in the Quiche region, as Quetzalcoatl in central Mexico, right? This, this yeah. concept. And so when we were talking about it, it was, it was, we were trying to make clear that it's not God in like a Christian sense. It's not a God in like a Greco-Roman sense. This is indigenous deity, which is a different thing. Mm -hmm. And so the reason it even came up was because we were talking about cosmology and how if, if there's three levels to the Mesoamerican cosmos, there's the underworld, there's the middle world, and there's the celestial realm, well then, when you go into the ocean, you go into the underworld. Yeah. So when they go into the ocean, they're actually entering an alternate cosmological realm within right. their um, like, 
consciousness of the way the, the world works. So then when, when Namor has the ability to move between all three realms like naturally, they're not saying, oh, you're a god. They're saying, you are our Kukulkan. You're the person who can do these things, move through all three realms, but for us. Mm -hmm. And I think it was, it was great the way they did. Um, they, they call him Ah Kukulkan, mm -hmm. which is the agentive at the beginning. So it's saying like, um, Tzib is the word for writing or for artwork. And so if you do Ah Tzib, mm -hmm. then you're the scribe or you're the artist. And so he's not Kukulkan, he's Ah Kukulkan, which means he's doing the Kukulkaning for his community. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. um, and I think that's, that's a really, it, 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 and it, it doesn't show up like readily, right? Because Mbaku says, you know, he's the feathered serpent God for his people, but that's because he's not part of that community. So he's seeing it the way academics and everybody else talks about it, which is he's some kind of God. And so again, I think what we try to do is make sure that everything is a portal to being able to explore more of Mesoamerica. Mm -hmm. So the hieroglyphs are not just random images, they actually tell his history that goes back to even Palenque and they move through Tulum and they go into the ocean. I mean, um, every, the, there's, there's a cup that, um, that Namor uses that's in his room mm. and the cup has a scene on it which is drawn from uh, an oral history that was preserved in, in Guatemala in the 16th century. Wow. Um, and so it was this idea that totally resonated for us that was an indigenous story but it resonated with the story that they were creating, which is that um, it's called um, Sapkoshol. And what it is is that there's this battle scene. It's a play of a battle scene between Spanish conquistadores and um, indigenous, I think, Cachiquel people. And pretty much everybody dies or, um, all, or the indigenous people will convert and they become Christians, mm -hmm. except for one person, one warrior. He escapes and he goes into the forest and he lives on his own. And so people see him every once in a while, but they call him witch, right? So he's the one who is different now because he lives in the forest, but he didn't take either side. He didn't become a colonizer and he didn't die. Mm -hmm. And so that was like the framework in many ways for thinking about how Namor sees himself, right? Even through this oral tradition that could have been preserved up into uh, the time that they entered the water. Could I ask you a question? Because, I mean, I think the details were beautiful. I mean, I think I got to watch this multiple times, right? It's my second viewing of it. But I, I don't know if this was intentional, but obviously, if y'all are familiar with the Popol Vuh, right? So the story of uh, how the Quiches and the humans were born, the origin story, um, long story short, there's two hero twins who go to the underworlds. They defeat the lords of the underworlds, and that's how the world was created, right? Hun Hunapu becomes the sun, and then Ishbalamke becomes the moon. And what I thought was really interesting was that neighbor brings the sun to his people, right, to the underworld. Yeah. So that's one path of the liberation. So the other path is the moon. And I viewed that as Wakanda, right? It was like mm. that alliance. So I wasn't sure if that was intentional, but that's, that's something that I... Yeah, I don't know that. Yeah, <laughs> okay. That's the next movie. Like, we're smoking geo now. <laughs> but it is neat because, you know, there uh -huh. is that whole astronomical side to it. And yeah, yeah. if you know the stories, Kukulkan is connected to Venus, which is the other kind of astronomical okay. element in that triumvirate. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, no, I mean, so I hope folks... I mean, yeah, I was hoping that they would let us do um, a text that just had all of the hieroglyphic inscriptions from the movie and then translate them and then you could see like the whole background history. There's yeah. still time. <laughs> <laughs> so can we talk about the technology? I think this is really fun. Um, that, and you know, we can come back to all of these things, but it, you know, the, the way in which technology is imagined in the film is really, really fantastic. Um, and it incorporates, just like the bracelet, you know, that, that he gives her and that has the fibers with the vibranium rich um, soil that, you know, she's able to finally um, figure out. And so this binds, you know, these elemental things bind them together. But the, but the machines, you know, the machines are built parts, they're, they're bits and pieces of all kinds of things. Um, and the, the vibranium detector is, is, is like an old robot, you know, it looks very strange. And so it's like, it's really fascinating to look at the machines and to think about the machines. Um, and yeah. I know that you like machines. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so, so history of science is kind of my jam, right? Because that's where I kind of came from. And so, so it was really exciting to me to think about, well, how are these two cultures engaging differently 
with technology. And it makes total sense that Wakanda has to see science and technology as, as like the thing that's gonna preserve them and save them, right? So Shuri is like the champion of science is everything, right? Like we need better tech. The Black Panther's gone, so what are we gonna do? Like let's make the Midnight Angels, right? So, so there's that version of technology because they're responding to global capitalism and the way that you know, we've used military escalation and consumerism and you know, the pharmaceutical mm -hmm. industry to, to create this world that we live in, but it's really a dysfunctional world, right? Mm -hmm. And so they have to protect themselves from that. But in Talocan, they don't have to worry about any of that. They're not driven by dysfunction. So they can say, we've got this great stuff, vibranium. We don't have to create TVs to entertain ourselves. We don't need iPhones, we don't need that stuff. What we need are the tools that will make sure that you know, we can protect ourselves if need be. But for the most part, our culture is already there for us. And so what we try to do with Talocan is make it a place where it preserves what's, what's essential to being you know, in their culture, in their, in, their li in their daily lives. But then the technology becomes utilitarian. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things, it's again, that imaginary space to say, well, what happens if we don't think that there's only like one high tech for everybody, every culture to aspire to, right? There's, like we think of high tech and we think of, you know, like keyboards and stuff that float in the sky or that are made of. Um, but, but what if high tech doesn't really enhance your life? What if high tech doesn't, you know, give you a, a better experience on a daily basis? Then let's use it for something else. And I think that comes out in the comparison between, be, between Wakanda and Talocan because Talocan is an autonomous indigenous mm -hmm. community. Yeah. They get to set their own term. Mm -hmm. And then mining is a huge um, theme in the in well in the whole franchise, <laughs> but um, definitely in the film. And um, along with the colonial, obviously, it has huge implications. So I wonder if we could talk a little bit about you know how that um, works in the film. Um, and for and and also the history of mining in, in indigenous communities in the past and in the present. Yeah. Um, yeah so I think that's I, it's directed to anyone in the panel. <laughs> <Don't look at laughs> <me>. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Um, the other metaphor when I was thinking about um, where the Mayas went, right? They went to the ocean, but in real life, right? So we have to remember that this is mimicking reality. Uh, people went and sought refuge in the mountains, right? And the Wakandans actually did that, right? They fled to the mountains. Today, the mountains are the sources of river, water, a lot of natural resources, and today they're currently being invaded, right, by um, uh, corporations, uh, foreign, <laughs> foreign countries, like the ones that were portrayed here, obviously, right? So I think we have to remember that this is something that's going on uh, today, right? So um, uh, vibranium, you know, it could be a bear, it could be um, uh, lithium in Bolivia, for instance, right? Uh, so we have to remember that if we love this film, then we have to really develop that allyship with real indigenous communities today, right? Um, and we actually, I, want, I do want to give a special shout out. There is actually an ancestral authority here from Kotsal. Uh, he's Tish Viom. He's actually been an active member, uh, somebody who has resisted and protected his community. So Tish pues a levantar la mano. So we have to remember if, if we love Namor and Kulkulkan, we have to support indigenous communities and not forget. And for those of us who were born in diaspora and or exile, we do need to go back home. Right, we do need to uh, build those international uh, networks of our peoples, right, in different communities, um, and actively resist in the same way and with the same cariño and love with, as as Kulkulkan, right? So, that's it. Nico, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Christine. Thank you.